that phrase and that chant just now, those who don't discern suffering. Sounds a little strange, doesn't it? You would think that everybody would discern suffering. But the verb here is important. Everybody experiences suffering, but not everybody discerns it. Discerning means to understand, to see it for what it is, and understanding it to the point where you can let it go. Where you can put an end to suffering. That requires looking at it very carefully. And for all the suffering we go through in our lives, we don't look at it very carefully. That's our problem. We have a lot of ideas about suffering. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, where did you pick up those ideas? Some of them go way back. to before the time when you even knew language. The first thing that happened after you were born was that you cried, unless you were too stunned even to cry. We've experienced suffering ever since then, probably even in the womb. There's a story they tell in the canon of about a young kid who stayed in his mother's womb for years. When he finally came out, he was able to speak. The first thing he talked about was how miserable it was, be what miserable it was there in the womb. So we've been suffering all along. And the way we dealt with our suffering from those very early times it probably still has an impact on how we deal with it now. Say there's a pain in your leg. You probably have a mental image of that pain. Maybe a visual image, a tactile image, a sense of its shape. Back in those days, as a little kid, when you believed in ghosts, maybe the pain was like a ghost. It was a thing there without had a will. It was coming after you. You didn't know any better. The problem is that even when your conscious mind knows better now, there, you're, a lot of your subconscious thoughts may not know better, any better either. This is one of the reasons why we have to meditate, is to get the mind still enough so you can see these thoughts. Because you have to understand that it's not that the mind is divided into two sections, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. It's just that there's conscious behavior in the mind and unconscious behavior, conscious events and unconscious events. And one of the purposes of the medit practice of meditation is to get more still, so that things that used to be subconscious suddenly become conscious. It's like bringing them up into the light of day. So we try to get the mind as still as possible so we can see what it's doing. You can compare it to tuning in a radio station. The more precisely you're on the frequency, the less static there is. And the less static there is, the more clearly you can hear the signal and pick up a lot of the subtleties that you couldn't hear before because the static was covering them up. So you get the mind still so you can see, so you can begin to discern the suffering around the pain. You'll be working on two levels. One is the, the physical pain itself, but then there's also the mental suffering. Doctors have shown that our perception of pain is really dependent on a lot of mental factors. This is something you're going to see as you meditate.
they can look at the pain center in the brain, see when it's activated or not. But they can't tell you anything about how pain feels. This is something that each of us can know only for ourselves. You get some people, they run the tests and they can't find any physical basis for the pain, but the, parent, the person really is experiencing pain. So just the physical pain itself has a lot of mental factors. And the most important one is the factor of perception, the way we label things. Sometimes the word sanya is also translated as memory, which is not really accurate. Memory plays a role. Our old perceptions of pain are going to be the things that we apply to our new experience of pain. But memory deals with the past. Here we are trying to focus on the present, and that we use our memories from the past to cover up the present, to shape our experience of the present. And so one of the things you want to catch sight of is how the mind labels a pain. When there is, say, a pain in your leg or a pain in your waist, a pain in the back, what perception does the mind apply to it? And if you can't see it in action, then you try consciously applying different perceptions. As you work in concentration, you should be getting some practice in this, because after all, each of the stages of concentration, all the way up to the almost the highest ones, are called perception attainments. Say you're working with the breath right now. That should be your prime perception, the label you put on your experience of the body is breath. Not only the in and out breath, but try to experience all the different parts of your body as types of breath energy. If your arm really were breath energy, would it be good breath energy or blocked breath energy? Just very consistently try to apply that label to your, the sensation of the arm. And after all, you begin to see that your experience of the arm is going to change. And try applying it to all the different parts of your body. See how that changes it. And you begin to see that the actual physical experience of the body is going to change because of that mental label. Because you start doing different things with the sensations. If you perceive a particular sensation as something solid, there's not much you can do with it. If you perceive it as a kind of blocked energy, well, there are things you can do with blocked energy. You can figure out how to redirect it, how to loosen up the blockage. In other words, the perception is useful because you can do things with it. And if you stick with that perception of breath and try to keep it as constant as possible, you learn two things. One is you begin to get more and more sensitive to what you're doing in order to maintain the perception. You start seeing the process of perception a lot more clearly. Secondly, you get the breath to calm down so it's really, really still. Once the breath energy in the, throughout the body seems to flow nicely, it'll get more and more subtle. And you stick with that one perception, you find that the, the brain is losing brain is using a lot less oxygen, and so you need to breathe less until you finally get to the point where the oxygen coming in and out of your pores is all you need. The breath gets still. When the breath gets still, your sense of the, the shape of the body begins to change. The sense of the boundary between inside the body and outside begins to dissolve away. You've just got this mist of sensations. And you can change your perception right there. Instead of focusing on the mist, you can focus on the space between those little bits of sensation. And all of a sudden you're with space. And if you can hold on to that perception of space long enough, it's going to change your experience of the present moment, your sense of what is it to have some, a physical body here. The potential for being a physical body is there, but you choose not to stir up that potential. 
to stay with the space. Just this much teaches you a lot about perception. Or before you go to space, you might focus on the different elements in the body, or might, a better word might be the properties, the warmth, the coolness in the body, the sense of heaviness. Perceive the body as, as all fire, or as all water, or as all solid. Just that perception will change the way you experience the body physically. They perceive them, all these various properties as balanced. And this will teach you a lot about perception. You begin to see the label a lot more clearly that you're using. And when you get more and more familiar with your conscious perceptions, then you begin to detect the less conscious ones as well. And you're ready to start taking apart pain. One of the first things you'll notice when you look at a pain is the sense that it's a solid mass in the body. Well, is it really, or is that the result of your perception? Try changing your perception and see what happens. Again, think of it as just little tiny dots of sensation that can move around that have space between them. The breath can flow through the pain. The blood can flow easily through the pain. Try to distinguish which of those sensations are just body sensations and which are, just, which are the pain sensations. And you begin to realize that all the things you used to glom together are actually lots of different kinds of sensation. And the way you perceive them was what made it so threatening. And you may have picked up that way of perceiving because you thought it was a good way of dealing with the pain. Putting a boundary around the pain you thought maybe will keep it from spreading. But when you really look at the process, you begin to see that many times that's an unskillful way of dealing with it. You can replace that perception with more skillful ones. And then you can begin to look at the other perceptions that come around the pain. The stories the mind tells itself about how long you've had this pain, or how much you've suffered in life, and poor you, all this suffering, all this pain. And you begin to ask yourself, do you really have to believe those perceptions? Do you really have to believe those stories? Can you stop making the stories for a little while? See what happens. Pain is an ex excellent place to start seeing all the different processes of the mind. Because you begin to see that it's not only a physical pain, there's a lot of mental activity around the pain that can cause the really important pain, the really important suffering, and that's the mental burden you feel around the pain. And if you look carefully, you can see these different stories, these different perceptions, simply as events in the mind. You can just drop that habit. See what happens. And what you're doing is not totally dropping the habit of perception, you're just using different perceptions because you find them more skillful. This is the Buddha's approach to all of the aggregates. It's not that you're trying to do away with form and feeling and perception and thought constructs and consciousness. At least not right away. The first thing you've got to do is learn how to convert them into the path. They use the word aggregates, heaps, the word kanda, or skanda in Sanskrit. You might think of them as big heaps of gravel. But 
then you have your choice. You can put the gravel in a bag and carry it around on your shoulder, weigh yourself down. Or you can figure out a way of turning it into asphalt covering for your road. Put it down on the ground, give it an, an adhesive connection, get some tar together, and then you find, suddenly find you've got a smooth road to walk on. The binding agent here is mindfulness and alertness. Learning to be very mindful and alert about how you use these different aggregates. Because the aggregates themselves, it turns out, aren't really things, they're activities. They're events in the mind, the four mental aggregates. And you begin to see that form itself is a result of perception, or your experience of form is a result, has affected by perception. And if you begin to approach all these things by being mindful and being alert, alert means looking at what you're doing and seeing the results of what you're doing, and then being ardent. One, mindful to remember you've got this issue of stress and the ending of stress. And being ardent, it means trying to figure out ways, if you see yourself causing stress, trying to figure out other ways of acting. That's what turns these events, that's what turns these aggregates into the path. So we're not condemning the conceptual mind, we're not condemning the mind that perceives things and puts labels on things. We're learning to look at the process and figure out how we can do it more skillfully. Ultimately, you do get to an experience that goes beyond the aggregates. But the only way to do that is to have develop this path. Turn them from a burden on your shoulder to the road under your feet. So if you want to understand perception, the first thing you've got to do is learn how to do it consciously. The more consciously you stick with a particular perception, say breath or space, the more you begin to understand about how the mind fashions perceptions. And then you begin to know where to look to see the less conscious perceptions, the ones that are causing stress, the ones that are causing pain. You see them in action and you can drop them, replacing them with other perceptions that are more skillful. And you finally get to the point where you don't need them at all. <laughs>